Uh, uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Ma Marvin. Yeah, sh sure. Um, uh, so I think maybe what's underappreciated is um, that a lot of the complexity, right, with the UTXA model uh, is uh, off-chain, right? So um, um, I would say like probably 95%, right, of, of your code and your infrastructure is off-chain infrastructure, is handling how to interact with smart contracts, how to interact with the blockchain, both in terms of, you know, submitting transactions, but also um, listening and ingesting, you know, um, activities or listening to events from the blockchain. Um, and so that is actually what um, is, um, takes, a, takes most of the time um, and um, to, to kind of get the full app to be uh, up and running. Yes, exactly. And I also think the tooling, I mean, because we are still in very early days, so I mean, smart contracts on Cardano were only enabled October last year, I think. So uh, it's it's still early days. So um, we, I mean, as Marvin said, I mean, you have all these off-chain challenges and there isn't really a consensus yet about what, what the right tools are for the job. So, so the community has provided uh, lots of, of alternatives and and I mean, everything is still evolving and everybody is struggling to find best practices. So that's, I mean, the, the challenge when, when you are early, that that uh, there are no ready-made solutions. Basically, you have to make things up while you're going. But of course, it's also very exciting to, to figure out all these things. Thank you both. I'm curious about your story. Before we even get into the technical details, what's the story of Genius Yield? Like how and why did you think it's important to offer what you're offering? I read in your uh, website that it's the first DeFi platform in the industry to combine a concentrated DEX with a liquidity management system. Obviously, that's very innovative. So how did this idea come about? Um, I, I can I can take this one. Um, so um, for, for me, uh, so I, I actually have I, I used to do a bit of consulting, working on yes, sorry. working on DeFi protocols um, on Ethereum um, and trying to uh, better understand how concentrated liquidity works uh, on protocols like Unisub V3 and finding ways to. Um, build, you know, yield optimization or liquidity management um, algorithms. And um, there was a lot of limitations on Ethereum due to um, transaction fees and, and kind of the lack of composability. Um, and so um, I want to bring kind of like all the potentials you, uh, that I, I, I wanted to build on Ethereum and bring it to Cardano. Um, and um, especially with Genius Sealed using this order book approach, um, it, um, it makes the, uh, with the, by providing concentrated liquidity, it gives a lot of more um, flexibility uh, to the liquidity provider to really optimize where the liquidity is placed. Um, but it also makes the job of a liquidity provider much more active uh, because they need to constantly, you know, readjust and rebalance the liquidity in the optimal price range. Um, and so in, in that sense, it actually makes a lot of sense to combine this protocol with the year optimizer to bring a bit of more automation for liquidity providers to not have to constantly, you know, switch their liquidity around and instead depend on uh, a year optimizer to do the rebalancing of their liquidity themselves so that they can maximize their yield um, while having also enjoying kind of like the automation um, that you would get maybe from an AMM where you can just place your liquidity and, and forget about it. That's kind of the idea of uh, combining those two together. Lars, do you have anything else to add? No, I think uh, Marvin said it really well. So, so basically the point is that it's uh, the system uh, DEX is much more efficient when you have this concentrated liquidity, but as Marvin said, it also puts much higher demands on the liquidity providers because to, to make keep it efficient and optimize the yield, they have to, 
a lot of adjustments are needed and for that it's ideal to combine that with an automated system so that you get the both uh, best of both worlds so yeah thank you marvin did you say initially you wanted to build on ethereum but decided to come to cardano uh yeah yeah that's right i actually do, did a bunch of consulting on on the optimizers on on the Ethereum and Cosmos um, as a kind of my first uh, uh, first introduction to to crypto. What makes you choose Cardano? What did you see in Cardano? Um, so, so for, for for me, so Cardano, I think people underestimate that the the, the core primitives are are really drastically different. Uh, than Ethereum, and so it actually really allow you to, in theory, build a different type of DeFi. So uh, DeFi is not just going to be better on Cardano; it's just going to be different, right? And it, it really goes at the core, right? Ethereum is a account-based model, which means it um, it's it's really good at like uh, it needs to track global states, and uh, the computation is a serial computation. On Cardano, at the very core, you know, it's a it's a distributed state, um, and every transaction is local, and that means that it makes parallel processing um, very very, uh, very trivial. Um, and so, the type of al algorithms you can build on a you know natively parallelizable um, um, smart contract system is very different from the type of algorithms you can build on 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 the account base. And so, the the difference I like to give is. It's like the difference between a CPU and a GPU, right? They both can do computation. It's just they can use different types of computation, right? A GPU is good for rendering graphic. A CPU is good for just, you know, making, you know, uh, fast calculations. Um, and so once, once you realize that Cardano just has different primitives, then you can, it's really exciting because now you can start thinking creatively of like what type of protocols are really well adapted um, for, for that kind of architecture and how can you really leverage that to, to its fullest. And so using, for example, like an order book um, base is one of those things that works really well on the EUTXO ledger, but actually is really hard to reproduce in an account-based model. Right. Lars, you have something to add? Yes, because, I mean, I didn't come to Cardano from, from the crypto angle but more from the from the haskell angle the programming language we use there and uh, so for me what was attractive in the in the beginning for cardano was the whole approach that cardano takes this uh, science first approach that um, it's not just like white paper driven i mean of course there are ingenious white papers out there i don't want to belittle that but um i mean cardano has always had the the, the idea to to get it uh, do it in like the proper established scientific way so proper research done at universities, peer-reviewed papers, and um, and then have that um, inform basically the engineering and and use and in order to do that, I mean you need your engineers basically be able to understand what the scientists are producing. And therefore Charles originally had this idea to use Haskell as a programming language because Haskell is, is quite close to mathematics and people that know Haskell normally have quite a strong mathematical background. Um, so he thought that would be a good fit for, for this type of, of blockchain. And uh, I agree with that. And I I like this approach. That's what initially um, attracted me to Cardano. Yes, I really appreciate the understanding of that and also your approach. Speaking of primitive, Genius DEX's core primitive is the smart swap, which enables many of the DEX's novel functionalities in a computationally efficient and elegant way. So could you expand a little bit on that? What does that mean for the normal, ordinary user? Um, I mean, I don't know whether Marvin wants to say something, but I can just say that, I mean, it starts with, I mean, it will be, of course, offer also the, the simple things for what people are used to, like limit orders. Um, but I mean, this smart swap, smart, smart swap um, allows a lot of flexibility. So in principle, it gives you programmable traits that you can 
I mean, they have all sorts of, of uh, arbitrarily complex conditions in principle. I mean, you trigger certain things to happen when certain conditions are met and so on. So, and, and that's, again, this composability that Marvin mentioned, that's, that's great on Cardano. So it just, basically, it, it, it just offers a lot of flexibility, or I mean, for like power users, while not um, making it complicated for, for normal users. But I think Marvin probably has much more to say about this smart swaps. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the idea is, um, uh, what is a limit order, right? It's it's an order that it's it gets triggered when you know a price a price is met, a, a price is matched. Um, and so, what if you used a different you know trigger condition than the price? Um, you could you know. Uh, execute based on maybe some on-chain metrics or or some you know uh, oracle data um and then that order could also be used to maybe trigger another order um and so in that sense you know you can start you know um um composing those those orders together into some kind of trading strategy um and then have them triggered based on different conditions um, so we're trying to kind of keep the primitives and the 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 core the the core logic really simple, but then achieve more complexity through like composability of of these different uh, orders together. Awesome, thank you for that, guys. Um, if anyone, we're going to start taking speakers now. So if anyone wants to come up, just raise your hand, and uh, I'll let you up to speak. Don't forget when you're up to pop your hand up so we add you to the talking queue. We'll have TCT in a second, but just quickly, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you guys is about the triple yield opportunities that you have on your decks. Could you just explain a little bit about what those three opportunities are? And then we'll move to TCT. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, so as a liquidity provider, right, you can, in theory, uh, earn three types of yields. So the first one is your LP fee, so liquidity provider fee, that's just what you would expect from any DEX. So every time someone uses your liquidity to uh, do a trade, right, you get a percentage of that trade value as a fee uh, to reward you from you know, providing liquidity to the DEX. Uh, the second one is through uh, yield farming. So uh, some pools will be sponsored through yield farming. So if you provide liquidity uh, to these pools, you will get a... APY on top of that um, for kind of, you know, attracting, for, for, for creating more incentives to for, for these type of pools. Um, and then the third one is something that, you know, you can really only do on Cardano is um, be able to stake your ADA, you know, while also participating in, in DeFi. So because Cardano has non-custodial staking, um, we will also be staking your ADA for you. Um, and so that would allow you to, if, if you're in a pool that also has ADA, then you would earn this third type of yield through, uh, uh, ADA rewards. Awesome. Thanks. Is there any way that, um, users of the platform can, uh, decide or vote on pools or groups of pools to actually, uh, stake with, or is that just your decision? Yeah. So I think we're doing it in a way that hasn't been done before yet. So, since we're providing concentrated liquidity, so every liquidity provider is providing liquidity, you know, at um, at different prices. Uh, without like we don't, we're not creating pools, um, actual pools, and so every single liquidity provider will be able to choose their own stake pool on an individual basis. Um, there's no need for voting or for a group decision. Um, if we have, you know, a thousand liquidity providers, then they will have potentially, you know, them staking to a thousand different pools. Yeah, awesome. That's great. So just the users get to decide where they're staking is that's fantastic. Um, well, I appreciate you answering them. TCT, over to you. So I'm trying to figure out a question I want to ask. The primitive one is obviously very interesting to me. Um, the ability for not just like public keys to interact with protocols, but uh, scripts, right? Um, so I'd like if we can go back and touch on that for a second. But like, I mean, my, you know, then my head goes to, well, <clears throat> you know, how are people going to do this? So is there any, 
I, I haven't been able to find a GitHub for Genius Yield. Is there anything about like getting other protocols um, and things ready for for being able to integrate or interact with the Genius Dex? Is there going to be any uh, more technical educational material or uh, um, examples put out anytime? I mean, you definitely are. Uh, sorry, Marvin, if you want to. I mean, we're definitely talking to, to other DEXs as well. And of course, we want to put everything out in the open and make it transparent. Um, I don't know exact an exact timeline for that when, when we will like publish the documentation. But but uh, we are certainly want to do that. That it's, it's just built in from the very start. That was actually our, I mean, part of our vision that eventually also, I mean, our own yield optimizer, for example, could also maybe... Um, use opportunities on other DEXs and vice versa, so that everything is compatible and and um, basically we can use the liquidity not only from our own platform but from others as well. Yeah, yeah, no, that sounds amazing. I know that uh, that there's definitely going to need to be some some time for people to kind of figure that out though and educate and uh, get educated about it. I um and kind of off topic. Do you guys have a um, an active Discord uh, invite. I, I seem to have gotten removed from that Discord somehow. Maybe I was inactive or uh, they just didn't like me, but I can't seem to find the Genius Yield Discord. Yeah, we, we can help you with that. I think we have some of our moderators in this call. So um, yeah, they, they'll, they'll help you with, with getting, getting to the Discord. Great, cool. And then, yeah, I don't know if you want to, if any, I don't want to keep hold it up, but um, like I said, my I think what's really important, like what you guys have been talking about, is the ability for not only pub keys, right, but like scripts, DAOs, other protocols, bots to interact with the with the protocol at a at a primitive level. So it's exciting to hear that. I know you guys talked about it in the past. I didn't know if you wanted to kind of touch on that a little more. I'd actually like to learn a bit more about that. If anyone would care to elaborate. That sounds really interesting. Uh, so what exactly um, is the question? So <clears throat> so a lot of uh, protocols right now, like you can only interact with a pub key, right? So like one individual can interact with it. Um, but when we talk about like primitives and interoperability, um, we'll have to have the ability for script addresses to interact with the protocol, correct? Not necessarily. I, I'm not sure I'm following you. I mean, the, I mean, the point is just if I mean, for example, one of our orders. I mean, anybody can fill it. You don't. I mean, you don't need a special signature to to fill it. So in that sense, I mean that that's interoperability right there because you could use whatever. Is, I mean, somebody else's liquidity to to fill that order. Our our order. What I'm about sure like, yeah. What about to like place it though, Lars? Like, so I only, you know, I have a, my public key, but then I have also uh, a native script, right? I have a multi-sig wallet um, or, a, or a DAO contract. Would that, that's what I'm interested in being able to interact with these protocols with. Um, right, I think I understand what you're saying. So you, I mean, for, I'm not completely sure I understand what you're saying, but I mean, if, if you have like, uh, if the money, f I mean, you, you can, for example, have the payment, of course, go to, to your DAO contract or to your wallet contract, um, uh, your multi-sig wallet, for example. I mean, you can place an order and then if it's filled, the, the payment goes to that multi-sig contract. But I mean, of course, you can't, I mean, on Cardano, for anything to happen, I mean, for a transaction to be submitted, there always has to be a human that signs it in principle. I mean, not necessarily a human, but I mean, it always has, I mean, the transaction always has to be signed by by something, right? I mean, contracts just, just don't just do things by themselves. So in that sense, there's always a human in the loop, or at least a, a bot that you entrust with your private keys. But I'm not sure I'm completely following you. Right. So, like, could will you be able to provide liquidity from a native script address or, a, you know, a DAO contract? Yeah. I mean, in the sense that, I mean, in the sense that, for example, the fees that 
to earn for swapping would go back to that DAO contract. In that sense, yes. I mean, you basically just specify an address where you want to receive your fees and, and nothing stops you from using a, a script address for that. Cool. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. Sort of a... Because, yeah, like you said, like, yeah, you need... Right now, you need one person, right? You need a pub key, one person's pub key to sign it. Um, and I think in the future, right, we're going to see people not acting as just, like, one person, but acting as a group uh, within a native script or a Plutus contract. Right. I mean, there are certain things at the moment in our contracts where you also need a pub key, like, if you want to cancel an order, for example. Um, but, for example, placing order is a different... So, I mean, placing order uh, would not have anything to do with our contracts. I mean, if your DAO allows that, I mean, to, to spend that money, to, to put it in our order, then that's basically your business. Uh, we don't care where the money comes from. I mean, that that's not how Cardano works anyway. I mean, scripts only jump into action when you want to spend something, not when you, like, produce something. Um, but yes, there are certain operations at the moment, at least, where, where you do need a pub key, but also a lot already, like with these addresses, where it's completely agnostic, whether it's a it's a pub key address or, or a script address. So you could certainly have have a liquidity pool where the where the fees go to to your DAO. Awesome. Thank you for that. TZD, did you have a quick follow up or should we move no, on? No, I'm gonna say thanks. Yeah. Um I'm interested to hear more about that or read more about that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Um, just before we move over to uh, Adafan, I got a question in the DMs from someone in the audience. They'd said, uh, I'd love to know what MLab's involvement is. Uh, what is Genius responsible for developing and what is MLab's responsible for? If either of you guys could enlighten us with that. So, of course, that's all. I mean, we, are, we try to be very agile, so, I mean, it's not set in stone. But at least historically, basically, we or I wrote the smart contracts and then we used help like from MLab but also other consultants like uh, Welltype to, to help with the rest. So with other Haskell code and and the MLab specifically, I mean we optimize our smart contracts to um, I mean we use something called Plutarch. Uh, it's basically a, another way to write Plutus that's that's a bit uh, that leads to smaller transactions and, and lower fees. So what we did I mean was that I basically wrote the smart contracts in, in Haskell and then some MLab engineers translated them into Plutarch to basically without changing the semantics, of course, but just um, to make them more efficient. So at the moment, that was that, that we basically or I did the smart contracts and, and then we had help with the other things. I mean, there's lots, as Marvin mentioned at the beginning, um, I mean, the smart contracts, even though they are, of course, of central importance uh, as far as like workload is concerned, Concerned only a small part. There are lots of other things we have to do to, to handle the off chain stuff, and that's what we get help with from other companies. Awesome, thanks for that, Lars. Um, Ada Fan, you've been up here for a while. Did you want to uh, jump in next? Yeah, yeah, I would like to. Um, I'm very interested in the, the how the concentrated liquidity works, um, particularly how does the reward to the liquidity provider get calculated if if I understand correctly, you can actually move their funds around. So is there just one pool and then you're free to, to move and then every to move funds around and then you know everybody gets a, a proportional reward uh, proportional to their stake uh, or does somebody have a f freedom to pick a segment of the curve and and have their own uh, have their reward, based on the, on a pool that's uh, context related to that segment and 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 maybe if, if you can kind of like just to make it understand like if there was a very rapid price shift and uh, that the uh, move to, to an area of the curve where there wasn't liquidity um, do you rapidly move liquidity there or or how do you prevent um, something that looks like a rug pull simply because you can't push liquidity there quickly enough. Okay, yeah, I can take this one. Um, 
So, so the way you initially described it, right? Like um, having a pool of liquidity where a liquidity provider gets a proportion of of the trades and the fees, right? That's that's the the paradigm that the AMM model is, is uses, right? This concept of pools. Um, yeah. Like for us, we we don't really have uh, really pools. They're kind of like you know fragmented uh, liquidity positions or fragmented pools. Um, and so individual liquidity providers, you know, place their liquidity at different prices. Um, and so there is when someone uses your liquidity for a trade, right, it's it's very clear where that liquidity comes from. It, it comes from a specific user. Um, so if your liquidity is being used by by an order, right, you get all the fees um, of, of that of that trade. You don't need to share it with other people because your liquidity hasn't been pulled with others. So that's that's the adv- the main advantage of concentrating your liquidity is that if someone using your liquidity, you get you get all that trading fee. Uh, but there are also trade offs, right? Because if your liquidity is not placed at the right location, then um, then your, no orders will be trading at that price, right? So you will get zero. Um, so it's a, it's like kind of like it's it's more of a high risk, you know, a high reward kind of situation. Or if you're in the right position, you get a lot of the trading fees for for lower liquidity and if you're in the, in the wrong position you get no trades happening um but maybe that mm-hmm. also could be a feature right maybe you only want to to have your liquidity being used at specific prices and not when the price drops and then suddenly your liquidity is being traded at a much lower price and so that's where we can kind of decouple from this idea of impermanent loss right we you also mentioned the idea of like oh are we moving down the curve uh, we don't have a curve, uh, so there's no curve to move down. It's completely um, uh, arbitrary the curve, and it's based on like people placing liquidity. Um, and so, if the drop price to a level that maybe you're not comfortable with, right, you your liquidity will not be traded at a lower price. Um, but it also means you could be missing out on on trading fees um, if you're not actively, you know, moving that liquidity around. Okay, so if uh, I mean, I would expect, like you would typically see on like Balancer, for instance, that there would be a lot of liquidity. Many liquidity providers would provide liquidity, you know, in a band around the current price, uh, assuming it was not on a voluntary day. So, uh, uh, not on a. Uh, uh, okay, it, the curve wasn't moving up and down quickly, so. Um, do you have that case where you have many liquidity providers actually concentrate and put liquidity around the same band? So how do you then uh, cho- choose, either choose one liquidity provider's liquidity or, or divvy up between all the liquidity providers in that band? I think that is one of the coolest features of, I mean, that we envision. <clears throat> I mean, we don't care because i mean this is i mean we we basically i mean there are orders and there are liquidity positions and um but how they are matched is is open so i mean of course we will like provide what we call bots i think others call them batches or whatever that match orders to liquidity positions and we can have some sort of algorithm i mean however but the point is that anybody will be able to to provide these um these bots and that means that I mean, we don't have to program that in some sort of fairness or so that will just be driven by by selfishness and greed. I mean, if, if there is like whatever, for whatever reason, because it's alphabetically first or so, um, a lot of bots concentrate on one liquidity uh, position to, to fill orders, that would uh, lead to congestion. So, so because, I mean, you can only do one transaction per block for one, for one specific uh, position then um, a lot of those would fail. So it's in, in the bot's best interest to basically spread it evenly between the, the existing positions at this price point or price range um, to, to maximize their chances of actually getting their transaction through and, and getting the, the fees basically for that. So there, it's nothing we, we have to program in so that just the, the fact that these bots are competing and every bot wants to fill as many orders as possible um, will lead to the fact that basically this fairness is, is like emergent behavior. And that's one of the, I, I mean, Marvin mentioned it earlier that 
we concentrate on the primitives and then we get complexity by composability. So that's one of these mm -hmm. examples. We just have, I mean, they're the completely independent liquidity positions. And then just uh, be because the bots are competing uh, for themselves, I mean, mm -hmm. for the user that will lead to like uh, this fair spread of, of, of like equally like uh, serving all or using all liquidity positions. So that's mm. uh, one one of the new things we we want to introduce. Basically, make this open for for everybody to to write these bots. Oh, okay. So, how do you guarantee that or or incentivize in such a way that uh, you don't have a, a a price range where nobody covers? I mean, if, I mean, if if people are not trading at that price range, then it doesn't matter if it's not covered. And if if uh, there are orders that would fall into this price range, then, then I mean, it's just basically financial incentive of the liquidity providers to shift their positions there. If Because as Marvin said, is that if they have the position at a price where nobody trades, they also get zero fees. So, so if they want to get fees, they have to go to the price ranges where people are actually wanting to trade. And that can happen in real time then. So, so let's say the price shifts quickly. The, there is some bot there that, that you know it doesn't that hasn't fixed a price range and say I'm only interested in this range. There, there's there's guaranteed to be some bot there that says, oh okay, I will cover this long tail uh, situation where the price just dropped, you know, twenty percent in 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 three seconds, something like that. There, there's guaranteed to be a bot that configured to say okay i will go down there and cover that liquidity i mean we have to be a bit careful i mean bots and bots i mean the bots i was talking about they don't have any influence of where the liquidity is i mean that, that's just a given i mean there are orders there are liquidity positions at certain prices and or that they just match what you are talking about now is is that liquidity providers shift their liquidity to somewhere else yep. and and that is actually what what marvin meant right in the beginning that i mean you basically would need to be awake 24-7 in order to do that, like in real time. And that's where the yield optimizing part comes in. So this is like a different class of bots. It's, I mean, okay. it's, it's like an automatic system that will basically manage your portfolio for you and uh, and then do these things. And and there can be various strategies, as you said, I mean, uh, whatever that, I mean, that's then where AI also comes in. Uh, to to like find a lucrative price range where you should shift your liquidity, but that's a different thing. So, so it's it's two sides. I mean, we have the the order matchers on the one hand, they just look at the situation as it is and find try to ma find matches, and then you have the liquidity providers who can do it manually or basically give it to our yield optimizer to to sh to, to quickly as quickly as possible possible follow the price development. Okay, so would I be incentivized then to 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 provide liquidity for a uh, a band that had a, like a very low percent chance that the price would ever be there to ever reach there? Would I get a higher reward if I if I set my bot or set my money to to be on a on a a price range that you had like one percent chance that they would ever reach as opposed to putting it, uh, you know, around the current price where I know I will likely, there will be need for liquidity. Is it, is uh, it, a, is it financially incentivized for me to try the long tail uh, positioning? Not explicitly, but I think implicitly, because if you are the only one that's sitting there, then if this 1% chance actually happens, then suddenly you will have a lot of traffic on your one position and nobody else is there. So you will get a lot of fees. But of course, it's a it's a gamble. But I think that basically just like the market forces will will naturally sort that out. Um, and uh, I mean, what the best strategy is. I mean, I, I think if, if everybody was at, at the current price, then probably for you, it, it would be worth the risk to, to go to a different price. Even mm -hmm. though it's maybe unlikely that it gets there, but if it gets there, you, I mean, you get, I mean, it's like Marvin said, high risk, right? high reward. So, um, I mean, mm -hmm. there's nothing explicitly built in that we provide. We, we just trust that that will like automatically happen if people like try to optimize their yield. Mm. Okay, I see. And that optimization would be in how they configure their bot, basically, give it parameters. Yes. Or, uh, okay. 
Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. another way to look at it is you're competing as a liquidity provider. You're competing with other liquidity providers. Right. right? So liquidity providers want to earn fees just like you, but it's not a fee, sh a fee sharing uh, mechanism, right? You don't spread the fees across all the liquidity providers. The, the fees goes to liquidity providers that are providing liquidity to those specific orders. Um, mm -hmm. So then it's basically supply and demand, right? So if there's a lot of demand for one price band, then a lot of liquidity will be there. But if there's a lot of supply, right, then, then the competition kind of like brings that away. Right, right. And, and you're able to respond almost real time uh, to if a bot want, says, okay, I want to move to this area, to this range, if the price moves there, uh, that means that uh, he provides liquidity almost instantly. There's no uh, there's no situation where there's a lack of liquidity and the liquidity doesn't arrive in time to fulfill a trade. I mean, real time on blockchain, of course, is quite leisurely <laughs> pace, right? I mean, okay, it's per, like a the... block every 20 seconds. But I would say, yeah, I mean, if they are, I mean, basically next block, I mean, this block, next you see block. that, I mean, this time, you, this, I mean, you observe there are orders that that you could fill if you if you had a liquidity position like lo at a lower point and then you can like in the next block you can have your liquidity position there so whether you call that real time i mean it's like at less than a minute or so i mean it's not microseconds as in like non defi trading but yeah I mean, that's the blockchain yeah okay cool so my last question is um because i know you're uh uh very proficient at the at the Plutus. Uh, did you use any formal verification or methods to guarantee the the um, accuracy of the or the I guess the uh, that it was con the conformance of your of your software? Uh, I'm at the moment. I mean, not yet. Although, I mean, I should say we have started. I mean. First of all, I should say that formal verification is is a range. It's not a yes or no. So, um, so I mean, somewhere in the middle of that range is is these uh, like property based testing, quick check, where you I mean, it's not a mathematical proof, but but you like hammer your system with thousands of randomly generated stuff and then see how it whether it follows the predictions that your model makes. So that we have started, and we will continue with that and intensify that. And then eventually we are also thinking about like doing like the, the other end of the scale, I mean like proper mathematical proof. But we haven't done mm -hmm. that yet, but but we have started like thinking about it, definitely. But at the so moment, it's uh, yeah, it's 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 like in progress. So it's like you use fuzzing to to test it. Yeah, it's I mean I think in high school it's sort of I mean yeah, you can think of it like that. So basically I mean there's this that's one of the really cool things about Haskell that I mean, a lot of languages have copied that, but it's not really possible in other languages like that, um, where you basically specify a property that, that you won't have. I mean, the, the classic example is like a sorting function that sorts a list of numbers. And then one property you could have, for example, is if you sort twice, you um, uh, sorting once it has, has the same result as sorting twice, for example. And then you can write that down, this condition in Haskell, and then the, this quick check mechanism automatically um, generates random lists of numbers and as many as you want, like 10,000 of different lengths, different sizes of numbers, and checks whether that property actually holds. And um, so you almost get that for free. And that's uh, actually very famous in, in Haskell in particular that was invented for Haskell originally. Whether you want to call that fuzzing, I don't know. I mean, it's similar, of course. So there's the idea that you uh, generate random data and then check whether it, it uh, satisfies the properties that you expect. And it's a bit more tricky to do that in a like effectful system like the blockchain, but it's possible. And uh, IOG has done a lot of research in that area and... Um, so there are ways to, to do that. I mean, this case of sorting lists is simpler. It's a pure setting, same input, same output. So the real world is messier, of course. But um, there are ways to, to basically use these ideas for, for things like blockchain as well. And uh, as I said, we, we have started writing these models. We are not completely done yet. But for the, like the core things like orders, liquidity positions, we already have such models and uh, using that. But we want to intensify that in future. 
Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Appreciate your You're answers. Welcome. Very welcome. Adafan, thank you for those questions. That was really insightful. Uh, Blockjock, you've been incredibly patient. Good to see you, mate. Yeah, hey, good. Thanks. What's going on, Rhys? Uh, Dumpling, uh, good to see everybody. Marvin, uh, Lars. Um, yeah, so I wanted to circle back to the the one thing that Cardano can do that any no other blockchain can, which is basically taking something that's in a liquidity pool and then be able to stake it to a particular SPO. Uh, currently, um, Wing Riders is doing it to where, in essence, there's a vote that happens based on the amount of liquidity you provide into a particular pool. Uh, so the ADA, which is the base pair, is then staked to that pool, whoever wins uh, on that particular vote based on the amount of you know uh, votes given to that pool, right? Um, which gives an empowerment to the end user as far as the ability to be able to move that ADA and stake it to a particular pool. And it's more of a, for me, a more of a philanthropic effort or endeavor to do something like that. Is that something that's going to be functionally available on Genius at the start? Um, as Marvin said, I mean, the situation in um, Genius is different. I mean, we don't really have pools. I mean, we, we do have them like as a concept, but not like on the blockchain. On the blockchain, they're just um, separate, like fragmented liquidity positions. So if you want to provide liquidity, you don't join a pool. You just take whatever liquidity you want to provide and place it in a so-called UTXO. So you place it in output on the blockchain at a specific price for a specific token pair. And um, if one of those, the partners in the pair is ADA, then you can freely choose um, to which stake pool you want to, to um, stake that. So while it's sitting there and earning you um, like tra trading fees, if people use that position to, to make swaps, um, you at the same time, you uh, earn the normal staking rewards that are just built into Cardano. And and so there is no need to, to do votes or anything like that because everybody is in control of his own piece of liquidity. So you can freely um, delegate it to wherever you want. And, and I mean, the cool thing is, on Cardano is that, I mean, normally staking sort of means you have to lock your funds away somewhere while they are staking. But on Cardano, that's not the case. I mean, that's just the address. I mean, you are in full control of your ADA and can spend them at any time. But while you are not, I mean, while you still have them, even in principle, if you don't, but anyway, um, you, you can delegate to a stake pool. And, and you can, we can use the same mechanism basically without any extra work. Uh, to do also do that for liquidity position. So while your ADA is sitting at your liquidity position, it's at the same time staked to a to uh, Cardano stake pool of your choice and earns you um, like ADA rewards. So I mean, of course, you can if you want to be philanthropic, you can donate it to to a um, to a charity. But I mean, you can also just go for the highest rewards, basically. So from uh, the point of view of the yeah, sorry. That's a, yes. that's a beautiful answer, though. Um, ultimately, that's really what I want, uh, because ultimately the, the vote in Wing Riders, I think, is really it, it's one way to say, hey, you have power over what where, and where this goes. But at the same time, it is a reoccurring revenue. And it, it, it's a I feel like a cheap pull of, of fee. Right. Uh, which is above. I think they're making point five on on Ada on every single you know, uh, vote, you know, um, or addition to your voting power, which they have a two level system there. So th that just makes me just more inclined to use genius versus any other decks once you guys go live. So, uh, thanks very much for that and, uh, look forward to when you guys launch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for that. Bloke. So we got, uh, Balbowski next and then talisman. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks for allowing me to ask a few very basic questions. Um, I'm just trying to better appreciate um, if I if a user was to to um, leverage the um, optimization bots, um, how that looks uh, from a user perspective. Is that essentially um, depositing two parable assets? I'm just curious how that looks um, as compared to uh, manually managing it yourself. Um, and you may have already answered this one, but I was also kind of curious when you use the term optimization is that solely predominantly dually with respect to um, trading fees and or yielding gens 
And I think that's really it. Uh, yeah, so I can take this one. Um, so, so the the Yo optimizer is is not not fully, you know, um, um, designed and completed. So the uh, I cannot say too much exactly on the user experience, but in in general, um, uh, you will be basically placing the liquidity in what we call like a liquidity vault um, that then will pull liquidity together, and then you would have some kind of bot that would execute a trading strategy for you and so interact with the with the decks on your behalf so instead of you as a liquidity provider directly interacting with the decks to place your liquidity right you place your liquidity in in the vault that then would uh, would then do the trading for you um the, the the strategy that they want to execute right is can be arbitrary so um you know there's no such thing as like the perfect strategies you know every strategy has uh, risk and rewards involved with them and uh, different, you know, like expected returns. Um, and also different strategies are good for different market conditions. Um, so that's where we wanted to kind of create, you know, more like a, a portfolio of different types of strategies with different, you know, parameters and then leave it to, up to the user to pick, you know, um, based on, on their risk level or their expectation of return, um, the type of strategy they want to use. Um, and then eventually, maybe in the future, you know, even allow people to build their own strategy and kind of share that with, with the community. Um, so that just to, to clarify, there will not be like just one single optimization strategy. It's just going to be just uh, many, many ones that then you can pick and choose and configure. Um, and then they will, they will execute the trades for you. And then you can obviously enter and exit, you know, whenever you want. Thank you. Thanks, Dalbowski. Talisman, you're up next. Uh, thank you for having me up. Bullish Dumpling, thank you for existing. Uh, your very existence makes the world a better place. Um, Lars, um, I'm wondering whether you, you have um, decided to leverage for yourself this idea I heard you talk about. Uh, one time a long time ago about smart contracts um, giving them the ability to be upgraded in the same way that we use system versioning for uh, classical software. The idea that you posted in Plutus Pioneer video cohort 2 lesson 3 very briefly you mentioned a technique where you have a quote manager smart contract and the smart contracts you want to update are, are replaceable inputs to that uh, manager smart contract. Have you leveraged that? Have you heard of anybody else doing that? I every now and again get the question where somebody asks whether it's possible to to um, have like versioning of smart contracts on Cardano, and then I always come back to that idea. I actually, I mean, at the moment we haven't leveraged it yet. Um, I mean, I, it's certainly at the back of my mind. So when we, I mean, when there's a need to have that. We'll certainly do it, but um, at the moment, I mean, we wanted to keep things simple, and I think there's not really a need to, for example, upgrade an order contract or something because it's a relatively um, volatile thing anyway. I mean, order normally doesn't last forever, so we could just, if we have like a better order contract, then we can fill the existing order so people can cancel them, and then we just, I mean, from that time on, we we use the new version. Um, but if there's really a need, I mean, if there's like a long running contract that runs for years where, where we could expect that uh, that there might be a need to upgrade then we would certainly like come back to that idea and do it like that or try to do it like that but uh, not yet we haven't uh, deployed it yet but uh, but of course I, I remember that there is this put, uh, possibility to do it I mean it's always a trade-off I mean you want to keep things simple I mean uh, and our smart contracts moment are extremely simple I mean they I mean, they can become complicated if they interact with other smart contracts and um, lots of interdependencies and so on. So I really tried when when designed the smart contracts to, to keep it as simple as possible. 
for example, our orders and our liquidity positions don't know anything of each other. The orders don't know liquidity positions exist. The liquidity positions don't know that orders exist. I mean, all, all orders care about are that they get paid. So there's a price, and as long as that's paid, the order is happy. Doesn't doesn't care whether it's uh, filled directly, filled by somebody's bot, uh, using a, a liquidity position with a swap or whatever. The liquidity position, all it cares about is that the swaps are correct. Uh, happening at the right price doesn't care why there's a swap um, or whether the other liquidity positions in the same transaction are involved in, in the transaction uh, and i think so what my point is that this this upgrade mechanism is relatively heavyweight so i would hesitate to to use that if there's not a, a pressing need to actually have that because i think it's very desirable to keep things as simple as possible to, i mean that's one way to to, to make it secure so that it's uh, easy to analyze it by the way, last last thing. Um, speaking of simple, I'm looking at a book on Amazon um, published by one Lars Brunas in 2004. Forms oh. of format equations and their zeta functions is the title. Holy shit. <laughs> like if there's any, any DeFi project that you should have blind faith in, if you can't fully understand it, it would be this one. <laughs> Thank you. But even there, I mean, the mathematics are get quite involved in that book, but the, the original problem is relatively simple. So it's just basic arithmetic. And I always like things like that, where, where the problem at least is simple. The solution might be more difficult, but yeah, but, but thank you very much. Yeah, I didn't realize that was a thing. That sounds quite interesting. Thanks, Talisman. Um, I've got some more questions from uh, in the DMs. One of them is uh, regarding Genius Token, why do you need it? Uh, what's the utility? And then, oh, well, then the follow up to that is uh, DEX tokens often dump because they have little uh, intrinsic value. So, how are you planning on incentivizing people to hold on to yours? Uh, sorry, uh, I missed the question. Could you repeat? Um, utility of the GENS token? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, so so the, the GENS token um, main utility is, you know, uh, staking and earning staking rewards and governance. So being able to vote in, on the protocol. And so through, st and then staking basically is, will have a, a, a staking uh, uh protocol that allows you to stay stake your gens tokens for either a flexible period of time or a fixed period of time um and then you would earn um you know staking rewards through that and those staking rewards uh, a portion of that staking rewards comes from actually the, the the revenue being generated on the platform right so revenue generated uh, in the dex revenue generated uh, by the yield optimizer right these get pulled to a treasury that then uh, distributes those rewards to to the um, to the holder of gens. So in a way, uh, you know, it's kind of a redistribution of of profits. Um, and so as as Genius Yields protocol, you know, become more and more popular and more and more people use it, um, then you will have like a direct. Um, it, it will directly impact, you know, all the gens tokens, uh, so that if if we do well, right, the gens holders also do well. So that's that's the idea between kind of like this more performance based uh, kind of staking reward mechanism. Yeah. So what what you're saying basically is it's not just for governance or as a yield reward, but it's at, you actually have a separate staking mechanism for the token that would incentivize people to hold on to it. Uh, in order to earn more. Yes, and and also not. I'm not a big fan of like you know s fixed yield farming. Well, you know you 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 promise this fixed yields, and then regardless of the performance of the protocol, right? You have to pump those yields, and so it creates you know a huge you know um, uh, increase in supply of of that token and, and increase of sell pressure. And it's not based on like fundamentally anything that has happened, you know, on your protocol. So we want the rewards and your API to be a representation of the the current, you know, um, performance of the DEX. So if one month the DEX, you know, generates a lot of rewards, 
then the next month you will see your yield um, uh, increase. But if another month the DEX doesn't do as well, right, your yield will decrease accordingly. And so the advantage of that is that we're not we're not paying something we can afford, right? And that's that's the main issue with fixed yields is that at some point those protocols burn out of tokens uh, by providing you know like pumping tokens and attracting people through that. It's a very short term strategy because at some point you will run out of of reward token to give out. And so uh, it, it makes more sense, at least to us, that uh, the amount of rewards you get is based on, you know, the revenue generated on the platform so that we can always afford your your yield in a sustainable way in the future. Yeah, that makes sense. We, we've kind of seen that happen on uh, Milky Swap where they are adjusting things drastically because they're because there's so much sell pressure for the tokens, essentially. So they've had to kind of curb everything back. And I think that happens on a lot of DeFi platforms. So it's nice that you're kind of preempting that and, and trying to address it. Um, I do have one other audience question as well. Um, they say, how is uh, Genius making money? Is it just from uh, the fees? So is it going to be very small incremental um, uh, income for you guys? Or do you have other methods of income? Um, at the moment, I mean, it's certain, as I said, the fee, or as we said before, the liquidity positions, each time a swap happens, the liquidity provider gets a fee and then we, we get a share of that. So that's one thing. Uh, then there is the, the bots. I mean, I did say that everybody can write them, which is true, but of course we will also provide our own. So the, I mean, it's not a fee directly, it's more like arbitrage or, I mean, making um, use of, of price inefficiencies. Um, so that's second um, source of income. And then, of course, once we have the yield optimizer, then obviously if, if you want to use that, then we will also take a, a share basically of that. And um, yeah, I think that's basically it. I'm not sure, Marvin, did I forget something? Yeah, yeah, that, that covers it. Thank cool, you. thanks for that. Um, and then I, I've got a couple of questions quickly as well. So, uh, Genius Yield isn't the only project. You've got the kind of side project called Genius X, right? And what I wanted to ask was you've had an ISPO for Genius Yield, and then you've in just immediately switched to uh, another six-month ISPO for Genius X. Uh, but why does Genius X need an ISPO? And also, what are you doing about Genius X tokens? Is there any real utility for them, or are you just raising funds for your project? So the, the Genius X uh, project, right, is a, a totally different kind of business um, business venture. Um, so it has two components to it. The, the first one is it's an accelerator program for projects on Cardano. Um, so we 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 have you know um, cohorts of people that enter our program, young developers, companies really at the beginning of their development phase, and then we kind of coach them and help them through like getting their product up and running. So things with like re mostly re business related, you know, helping with fundraising, setting up the entity, building out their team, building out their pitch deck, you know, uh, designing their tokenomics, um, really like all the things that that is needed to get to, to get kind of not just your smart contracts, but the whole business off the ground uh, to develop on Cardano. But the, the second protocol is we're also building a, a launch pad for token sale. Um, so uh, this launch pad would allow, you know, anyone in our, in our cohort, but potential so anyone on Cardano to, to launch their token um, and, and, and execute a public sale. And so actually Genius Yield will be the first to participate on the launch pad uh, for, the, for the Gen's token sale. Um, and so, um, that's, that's where the, the, the fundraising, uh, is needed is, um, we, we need to fundraise for building out this, this launch pad, um, which is a, a totally different separate product. And then the gens X token will be used for, um, allowing you to participate to the launch pad. So, um, um, you can maybe uh, check out our documentation for the launch pad. I don't exactly know the, 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 the whole the mechanisms, but it's around staking your Gen X token will allow you to get access to different rounds of a token sale um, and, and be able to you know get an early access of uh, on, on on those um, token sale events. 
Awesome, thank you. And so, um, are you? Do you have any other ISPOs planned after this second one, or is that going to be the end of it? Uh, we do have something planned. Um, I think that hasn't been announced yet. Um, so, um, yeah, I think I'll, I, I, I won't say anything there. I'll just say that, uh, yeah, we do have something uh, coming up after this. So that'll be a third six-month ISBO after Genius X finishes? Uh, not quite. I mean, the current Gen X is four months right now. Uh, so it's a bit shorter, and then the other one, I'm not quite sure of the of the time, but uh, it will be a different type of ISPO. It won't be your regular ISPO. Um, but yeah, just stay tuned for, for, for more details. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I think that's about it for me. Um, so I'm going to hand back over to Dumpling. Uh, but first, I did just want to say, Lars, thank you for uh, your work with the Pioneers programs, all of them. Um, I really enjoyed them. And I appreciate that works really good. Thank you. Uh, Dumpton, back over to you. Right. Thank you, Riz. Thank you very much, Genius Yield team, for coming. It's an honor to have you joining and chatting with us. Very much looking forward to the Yield Optimizer and earning multiple rewards. Next, we're having a dumpling dungeon. So I'm inviting some new DeFi project on. I know it's going to be spicy. Right now, recruiting judges for the dungeon. So contact me if you want to judge.